almost a continuation of Mark's thoughts during the communion or before the communion. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 2. And on the day of Pentecost, as the uh, Jews that were gathered there, the crowds were, uh, I guess, accused of actually killing the Son of God. We start in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They, were, uh, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes uh, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's great to be able to share this time now and focus on the words, specifically this text that Reese read for us from Acts chapter 2. And before we get into discussing that text, I just wanted to mention a few things before the message. Uh, some of you will be attending the Affirming the Faith seminar down at the North MacArthur Church in Oklahoma City this Friday night and, and Saturday. Uh, I'll be speaking down there at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, and I hope to see some of you there. I know that some are uh, planning on attending. If you'd like to know more about the offerings this Friday night and Saturday, you can go to the website. I think it's affirmingthefaithok.com. There are some schedules out on the, um, on the information center as well. And for that reason, I'll be staying over next Saturday night. I'll have the opportunity to preach at the East Side Congregation in Midwest City next Sunday morning, teaching class and preaching there which means that Scott will be sharing the message here next Sunday, and I know that you'll be blessed by the message that he is preparing. And then next Sunday night, um, Brother Brill, I just went blank on his first name. Is it Scott? Chris. I did go blank on his name. Chris Brill from uh, Hope Harbor will be here next Sunday night to share an update and additional information about that wonderful ministry at Hope Harbor that is near and dear to the hearts of many here at the Broken Arrow Church. So Scott, thanks for preparing to share that message next Sunday morning and we look forward to Chris's presentation next Sunday night. Uh, David Maynard mentioned milestones, that it was the five year anniversary of the Basket Family service with us here at Broken Arrow. I uh, was told that today is a milestone for Warren Smith, who is having his 85th birthday today. So if you know Warren, please uh, congratulate him and wish him a happy birthday before you leave today. And it's also the, the third birthday of Life Groups. Uh, Life Groups turned three today. It was three years ago in February 2010 that we launched this ministry, and I again want to thank uh, the leaders, the co-leaders who are the, the heart and soul and the machinery behind this ministry that, that keeps it uh, moving forward in positive fashion. I want to thank the elders for their blessing on this ministry and encouragement in this ministry. And you'll probably notice a new insert in the bulletin today. This is going to appear each Life Group Sunday. It will list the groups that are currently active along with the meeting place and time of those groups, and so that information will be updated on a monthly basis. Uh, this is primarily to be assistance to our guests who uh, may be worshiping with us today and heard about life groups and thought sounds great, uh, where and when, and I'll be there. Uh, this gives you an idea of how many different groups we've got meeting, and given the meeting time, some that are right after services, some uh, are not till this evening at five o'clock, whatever works best, for you and your family schedule wise, uh, I, I assure you, you would be welcome at any of these groups. 
and uh, members as well who have not been involved in life groups up to this point. Uh, if you have an interest on any given life group Sunday, uh, just pick one of these groups and, they, and show up and they would be very, very happy to see you. Since last February, on Life Group Sundays, we've been doing this cloud of witnesses study. So I guess it's having its first birthday today. Uh, I think this is the 14th lesson. We've had a couple of Sunday nights thrown in there. But the cloud of witnesses study on Life Group Sundays is focused on men and women of faith of the past whose lives serve to inform us and inspire us and encourage us and challenge us and sometimes convict us in relation to our own walk with God through Jesus Christ. And so probably 14, 15 months ago, in preparation for the beginning of that series, I asked you who you wanted to focus on. Uh, rather than me just picking men and women out of the Old Testament and New Testament, who do you want to hear about? And you responded in great fashion. I've got a long list of people, uh, men and women from Scripture, some of whom we've already talked about, some we will continue to cover in the months ahead. But some very thoughtful person uh, said, rather than just indicating an individual, said, I'd like for us to talk about those early believers in Jerusalem, uh, those Christians that we read about in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. And in response to that suggestion, we're talking about first responders this morning. Uh, Scott, thank you for the children's lesson this morning. Very uh, enjoyable, effective job talking to us about the place that first responders have in our culture and our society. They are critical to the functioning of our culture. Uh, we depend on them so much and as Scott suggested, take opportunities to show appreciation, support, respect, honor to those uh, policemen, those firefighters, uh, the search and rescue people. Um, EMTs, paramedics, those people who are first on the scene when tragedy strikes. Uh, we understand the important role, the vital role that first responders have in our lives. And that's the phrase that popped into my head as I reread these texts, especially in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost and the preaching of Peter and the other apostles and these about 3,000 people respond, respond positively. And so I want us to consider them as first responders this morning. They become a part of what could be called the mother church of all Christianity. Some of you have been to Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it was built as the Union Gospel Tabernacle in 1892 by Thomas Ryman, who was a local preacher, local evangelist. And for many years it served as a tabernacle. It served as a church. And uh, even for those of us with a, a history among Churches of Christ, some of you are familiar with the name of N.B. Hardiman. And over a long period of years, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in Nashville, he preached a series of lessons at the Ryman that came to be called the Tabernacle Sermons because they were proclaimed at the old uh, Union Gospel Tabernacle. And then the Grand Ole Opry showed up and started using the Ryman uh, for the, the Friday night and Saturday night Opry. And sometimes you'll hear the Ryman referred to as the mother church of country music uh, because that's where so many artists got their start. So this concept of mother church is something that's a part of our vocabulary, a part of our collective consciousness. But in a very real sense, that Jerusalem church was the mother church of all Christianity. It was from there that ultimately because of persecution, Disciples scattered into Judea, Samaria, and from there to the remotest parts of the earth, including Oklahoma, USA. Uh, we can trace our spiritual roots all the way back to that mother church in Jerusalem. I love this statement from Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Church. Uh, in talking about this field of study known as church growth and sometimes how off base and scientifically we can approach the subject of church growth. Warren wrote that the New Testament is the greatest church growth book ever written. For the things that really matter, you can't improve on it. It's the owner's manual for the church. And I would only try to make a suggestion to Warren uh, in one slight way. I, I would call it the user's manual of, of the church, uh, written by the owner, okay? So this is the owner's manual in the sense that, that he wrote it. 
Uh, But for our benefit, it is the user's manual for the church. And so much of what we need to hear and internalize and practice about the growth of the kingdom of God can be found right in these pages of Scripture in the book of Acts. Uh, We know the story, the back story. uh, And if you're less familiar with that, I might suggest that you read Luke 24, the last chapter of Luke's gospel, volume one of Luke's work. And then chapter 1 of the book of Acts, which is volume 2 of Luke's record of the impact of the life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And in Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, you'll find Jesus telling his disciples, I want you to stay here. I'm leaving, but it's not going to be long before power comes from on high. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you just follow the Spirit's lead. And it it wasn't very long, maybe about 10 days by most most calculations between the ascension of Jesus and the day of Pentecost. Pentecost came 50 days after Passover. And so this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, would have been seven weeks to the day from the day of the Lord's resurrection. Seven weeks, that's not very long. Uh, Looking back seven weeks, if you remember December 30th, the last Sunday of last year, everybody was, you know, Christmas was behind us. We were getting ready for the new year. Uh, From December 30th to today is that same seven-week period. And the Spirit did come, manifesting His presence with the sound of, of a mighty rushing wind that came from heaven, filled the room where the apostles were. And this incredible visual uh, impact uh, was made upon them as they saw these tongues as a fire resting upon the, the apostles. And they began to speak in these other tongues. Uh, tongues of the peoples of the Roman Empire who had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Some of them, because of distances, had probably stayed from Passover through the, the additional seven weeks on to Pentecost. But some of these men, Galilean fishermen, uneducated, unlearned, unschooled, formally by the rabbis, certainly hadn't been the language school. And suddenly they're they're speaking in the native tongues of all of these people who have gathered in Jerusalem. Uh, It caused some to question the sobriety of the apostles, but as Peter, speaking for the rest, begins to make his defense, he says it's just 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, It's way too early for even anyone to be considered to have had too much to drink. This isn't the effect of wine. This is the effect of the Spirit of God. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. And he quotes extendedly from uh, Joel chapter 2. He will go on in his message to quote from Psalm 16 and Psalm 132 and in Psalm 110. And Reese read for us the, the response to his message. These people were convicted. And they wanted to know what to do. They were convicted about who Jesus was. And that's something that I want you to notice about the the message of of Peter and the apostles. After he goes through this introduction, uh, quoting from Joel chapter 2 and verses 17 through 21 of Acts chapter 2. He says in verse 22, men of Israel listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene. And then he will mention the name of Jesus numerous times. He will make references to he. He will make references to him. Jesus is the first point of the sermon. Jesus is the second point of the sermon. Jesus is the third point of the sermon. Jesus is the conclusion of the sermon. And he throws in a poem about Jesus uh, from the Psalms. Even his poem is about Jesus. This extended quote uh, from Psalm uh, 16 here. Verses 25 through 28, for David says of him, David says of Jesus, I saw the Lord always in my presence. He's on my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make full Uh, You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And he goes on to say, David's not writing about himself. When he talks about this soul that was not abandoned in in Hades, this one that was not allowed to undergo decay, he says, you can visit David's tomb to this day. This is a poem, this is a psalm about Jesus. 
And they were convicted about who Jesus was. His concluding uh, point, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. They were convicted. Now what did they know? Some of these people were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, some a little older. They had been following all of their lives, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their their spiritual forefathers, back in the first part of Acts chapter 2, were told that even though these people are from all over the Roman Empire, they are Jews and proselytes. So they're all religiously Jews, most of them are ethnically Jews, and some of them are ethnically Gentiles who have been made proselytes of the Jewish faith. But their life has followed a pattern up to this point, the pattern of serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, studying the law, studying the prophets, studying the writings, worshiping in the temple, worshiping weekly in the synagogues, and now the game has completely changed. And all previous bets are off because of what they now believe about Jesus. So compared to what they knew In Judaism, compared to now what they know and are convicted of about Jesus, what did they know at the time they felt convicted and made this decision and followed through with it? Basically, just that Jesus was Lord in Christ. That's pretty much the sum of it. Jesus is the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He was the promised one. He is the Christ. And I am lost And he's my only means of salvation, so what do I do? Just tell me. Sign me up. And the answer was simple. Repent, turn from sin toward God. Be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's about the sum of it. As far as what they knew, what they understood, what they had processed... Had they had all of their questions answered? No. Did they have all of their doubts and reservations satisfied? No. Did they have all the theological issues sorted out and figured out? No. When Peter says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, uh, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, their, their response wasn't, okay, so explain how grace, faith, and works all figure into this. That really wasn't their concern. The response wasn't, okay, before I commit to this, are are you guys conservative? Are you guys liberal? Are you guys premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, panmillennial? I think that would have been Peter's answer to them at this point. It's it's panmillennialism. It all pans out in the end. You don't need to worry about that right now. You just need to deal with this fact that you're convicted that Jesus is Lord and Christ and here's what you need to do. Their response to Peter when he gives them the answer wasn't, do you have a staffed nursery? You know, if if I make a commitment here, if I make a decision, if I get in, you guys got a staffed nursery? You got a youth ministry? Serve coffee and donuts? Zumba classes that I can attend? What's worship going to look like? Where are we going to meet? How are your Bible classes set up? Do you guys have worship first and then Bible classes, or Bible classes first and and then worship? I need to know before I make a commitment. Um, What's leadership going to look like? They haven't thought about any of these things. They haven't processed any of this. What are we going to call ourselves? Let's start with saved. Let's start there. And once we can call ourselves saved, then we'll start to work through all of these other issues. None of those other things mattered in that moment. None of those other things mattered in that moment. So, Tim, are you saying that none of that other stuff is important? I don't think I said that, did I? I think what I said was that none of those other things mattered in that moment. The only thing that mattered then was receiving salvation through Jesus Christ. The rest would be worked out as they went along. See, they weren't converted to the church. They were converted to Christ. 
And God added them to the number of the saved. They're not even going to be called the church for a while. I think Acts chapter 5 was the first reference I could find to the word ecclesia, the word church. They were converted to Christ. Having been converted, God added them to His church. I guess you could call them charter members, these first responders. And in a sense, they weren't really committed to the church, other than in the sense that they were committed to one another. They were the church. They were committed to Christ. And as a result, they were committed to one another. As I look for encouragement and instruction and inspiration from these first responders, I'm instructed, I'm inspired, I'm encouraged by thinking about the faith and the courage that it took for them to do what they did. Because they didn't have a road map, you know. We kind of know what the road map was because we read the book later. We've got the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter and the next chapter. They're living it. They're a part of it in the moment. They had to consider leaving everything they had known up to that point in time. Yes, there was going to be continuity serving the same God, but now we know who His Messiah is. We're going to be using the same scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so that's why Peter quotes from them in his powerful lesson. And new scripture is going to be revealed. God's ongoing revelation is going to be made known to us through the Spirit. But that was about it as far as continuity. Things were never going to be the same and there would be no turning back. And I see these first responders, I see these men and women on Pentecost as having the faith of Abraham. Having the faith of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God says to to Abram, who has already left Ur and is settled with his family in Haran, God appears to him and he says, get up and go to a place that I'll show you. And Abraham had enough faith to go. He didn't know where he was going, he just knew who he was going with. And these men and women didn't know where they were going. They just know who they just knew they who they were going with. They were going with Jesus. They didn't know what was going to happen the next week or the next month, or what things were going to look like in a year. They just responded in faith, in submission, in obedience. 3,000 of them. Chapter 2, verse 41. So then those who had received His word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. I can barely make out the number back there. 608 looks like. Five times the number of people who are present were baptized that day. Probably took a while, don't you think? And I doubt they were using the same baptistry, which they didn't have. Where did they go? You know, you read in the Gospel of John about the pool of Siloam. You read about the pool of Bethesda. Those were probably likely places, maybe other pools in the area. I don't know if there are any deep spots in the Kidron Brook down at the base of the hill between Jerusalem and and the Mount of Olives. Uh, People probably being baptized everywhere that day. And number 2,999 and number 3,000 were just as precious to God as, as number one. There was as much rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over that 3,000th person who was baptized into Christ that day as the very first one. And they become this body of believers. Verse 47, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I know you may have an older translation that says church there. Ecclesia is not in that verse, so, you know. I, th- I still think it's chapter 5. Don't corner me after services and says, my Bible says it's in verse you know, 47. Church appears there. Uh, Ecclesia is not there. God added to them, God added to their number those who were being saved. And what we, we see from these people, and David, I'm assuming you uh, read the text and worded your prayer accordingly because the end of your prayer was pretty much an outline for this, this part of the sermon how they were a worshiping body of believers, they were a fellowshipping body of believers, they were a learning body of believers, they were a praying body 
of believers. We don't have time to run through all of these, these scriptures, but just as you read Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 12, notice the number of times the church is together and they are praying. Verse 42 here, they were continually, this is Acts 2 again, verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Uh, their, their fellowship was so important to them. I'm grateful that, that we seek to be a, a worshiping church and a fellowshipping church and a learning church and a, and a praying church, which reminds me about the, I didn't bring it up here, but the prayer request card for the prayer marathon on March the 8th and 9th. There are additional cards available on those back tables. As you exit the auditorium, there's some out by the ASAP box in the foyer. There's some at the information center. Continue to take those, fill those out, have others fill them out, bring them, put them in that box, and we'll pray about those things on the 8th and 9th. That prayer marathon is just one example of how we seek to be a praying church. But individually, we seek to be devoted to prayer as well. Uh, they were taking their meals together with, with gladness. I'm grateful for the opportunities we have for that, whether it's a congregation-wide thing over in the Outreach Center or the Golden Agers getting together on the second Sunday of the month or getting together like many of our life groups are going to be doing today and, and sharing a meal together. Those meals that they shared were great equalizers because it brought together men and women, young and old, Jews and proselytes, and later Gentiles, the rich and the poor, citizens and slaves, all ate the same bread, all shared the same meal. And they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the apostles' doctrine. They continued to ask and seek and knock. They continued hungering and thirsting for righteousness like newborn babes, which all of them were. They were longing for the pure milk of the word so that by it they could grow in respect to salvation. And so through worship, through fellowship, through study, through learning, through prayer together, they came to have this sense of identity and community and, and mission. As far as identity, it was, it was their number. We don't have time to turn there, but chapter 4, verse 32 says that they were of, of one heart and one soul. We're going to be able to talk in our life groups today about what that means. Does that mean you see everything alike? You agree on every single point? What does it mean to be of one heart and one soul? I think it means that they were on the same spiritual page, and that was God's page. They had the same Savior. They had the same identity as God's children and disciples of Jesus Christ and sanctuaries of the Holy Spirit. And they had the same message, which was to share the good news with others. That's how the Lord was able to add to their number daily those who were being saved. That's why by Acts chapter 4, verse 4, the number of men numbers 5,000. Not just an initial 3,000 converts, but 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And it brought about this sense of community. Uh, we are from diverse places, diverse backgrounds in this congregation. And while these people shared Jewishness, that was about it. Beyond that, they were from all over the map, literally. They were from all over the map. Go back and read all the places on the map that they were from. But because they were a community of faith, if one member suffered, all the members suffered with him or her. If one member was honored, then all the members rejoiced with him or her. They rejoiced with those who rejoiced and wept with those who wept. They bore one another's burdens and thus fulfilled the law of Christ. And they had this consciousness of, of their mission, which was to share that good news of salvation with others. So as I mentioned by chapter 4, verse 4, a number of disciples is, is equal to 5,000 men. And, and the last verse I want us to, to look at as is, is time is uh, fleeting away. Chapter 4, verse 42. 5, verse 42, I'm sorry. This is after Peter and John and the other apostles have been punished for their, their preaching of the gospel. And they have been released. Verse 41 says, So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, 
they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Uh, Three-year anniversary of, of our life group ministry today. That's just one way in which this congregation seeks to be a worshiping, fellowshipping, learning, and praying church. And how we seek to meet collectively as we are this morning and also from house to house. It's just a methodology, it's just a means of keeping on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I take great encouragement from these first responders. Um, they, they challenge me, they convict me, and often they shame me. When I examine my own life, my own commitment, my own faith, do, do, I, have the, do I have the faith that they had? What I have left what they left, not knowing where it was going, what it was going to lead to, to just trust God for, for the outcome. I pray that God gives me that kind of faith. I pray that God gives us all that kind of faith. And if you're among those who are, are convicted about who Jesus is, that He is indeed Lord in Christ, that there is salvation in no one else, we would ask that, that you would join those responders and, and the responders since. Don't have all the answers yet? You're in good company here. Still trying to figure things out? So is everybody else here. Still struggling with sin? Yep, that's us too. None of those other things really matter. All that matters was they knew who Jesus was, they knew they were lost, and they knew they wanted to be saved. If that's what you want this morning, we would encourage you to do that as we stand and sing.